This video is brought to you by my fantastic patrons. Join today to receive exclusive benefits from the channel. Link in the description. One of the most important elements in the Storybots franchise, by far, is the characters. We all love Storybots for many reasons, of course, but you can't deny that the characters in the Storybots universe play a massive role in its core appeal to fans. Namely, in its main cast, Answer Team 341B. This is the group everyone is familiar with, the five colorful robots that we've been following along for years now. But of the five Storybots in the team, which one of them is the most important? Now you might be thinking, uh, duh, it's obviously Beep. She's the leader of the group and keeps everyone in order. And while, yeah, her importance to the team is extremely vital and all, and she was the first character concept in design, I don't think she's the greatest, nor is she the most important. For I think there's a bigger picture into the storybots that make up this famous team. When looking at all the characters in the team, one of them sticks out in a very unique way. And that's the one we'll be talking about in today's video. Now before we get into that, I want to bring up someone else important here. Aaron Fitzgerald. For those who are unaware, Aaron is a Canadian voice actor who's been voicing characters for nearly 30 years. In that time, she voiced a massive amount of characters throughout her career. Arguably her most famous role was in Ed Ed and Eddie as Naz and May Kanker, as well as some other minor roles in TV shows, like Wendy from Dragon Tales, and her numerous roles in the Monster High series. She also has her fair share of roles in video games, such as Parasol and Skullgirls, and Chie from Persona 4. But of all the characters that she's voiced over the years, there is one that she holds very close to her heart. For this character I think had the biggest journey out of all the Storybots combined, and the one that I personally deem as the most important character in the entire Storybots franchise. How this one Storybot not only became an icon amongst fans, but also how it transformed this once ordinary voice actor into someone that is truly remarkable. And I can safely say without a doubt, that Bo is definitively her favorite. And this is her story. Bolina Bumblefoot is the purple storybot in Answer Team 341B. She is the biggest storybot of the group, both in size and in character. She is filled with a bunch of emotions, and can't really decide which to choose first. Sometimes it's beneficial, while others can get her into trouble. She can also switch between emotional moods in the blink of an eye. She may be happy and cheerful in one moment, and in another, she'll be in a pool of tears. But if there's one thing that Bo loves most of all, it'd be one of two things. Her friends, and unicorns. Lots and lots of unicorns. And sometimes kitties too, I wouldn't forget that either. Without question, Bo is single-handedly an important figure in the Storybots world, more so than the main leader herself. Her involvement in the show's running is a real standout, and is truly a force to be reckoned with. I know a lot of you have been waiting anxiously for a proper analysis on this character. So today, finally, we will be examining just what this purple gal is all about. Prepare yourself for a nice, lengthy analysis, because we have quite a lot to talk about regarding Bo, the most important character in Storybots. Bo's introduction to the show started off pretty much like everyone else's. Her design and personality would be taken from an early character card made in 2012. Here we get our first glimpse at all the members that would soon become Answer Team 341B, some of them having early features and quirks that were never implemented in the final. For Bo's character, she would be depicted as the emotional type. She was kind of like the empath of the group, the one who exhibits all emotions, such as happiness, sadness, anger, etc. Unlike the other characters where they either have one or two emotions attached to their motif, Bo was the sole exception, for she would portray all sun emotions at once, and effectively I may add. I think that alone is what really makes her incredibly unique from the team. Her big size is not only for looks, but for compassion and feeling. Pretty admirable stuff all around. Her first proper exposure to the public, as well as the others, were in the animal songs. None of these characters would emote any of their traits in these music videos, as they were solely being used as dancing background storybots. And our main attention would be drawn to... 
well, the animals themselves, obviously. It wouldn't be until the Emotions songs where we get to see their characters come into play. In Bo's signature song, Feeling Sad and Blue, her main emotion in that song is, you guessed it, sadness. And honestly, that's pretty clever for Bo's main emotion. Think about it. When someone hears the word emotional, usually it's sadness they think of first. And having that be Bo's major sentiment is pretty fitting for her character. And what's even better is that it's not just about Bo being sad all the time, as we later see Bo feeling cheerful again after healing from her depression. Nice to see they don't just stick to one emotion and have that be the status quo of her character. Just imagine how dull and repetitive that would be. In the ensemble song, Love's Not Just a Word, we see her caring side come into light, showing the others how much she loves being with each other, and how much she really appreciates all her friends. A very gentle approach to her character, and a great segue into her future appearances in the franchise. The Emotion songs really were a great introduction to her character, and probably the best portrayed out of the main five in my opinion. In a later song, she got her appearances here and there, but nothing too major regarding her personality. And then it was time for casting. During the creation of Asa Storybots, the first television series created by the team, they needed to find voice actors to voice each of the main characters in the stories. They soon hired Canadian voice actor Erin Fitzgerald to take the role of Bo. She herself had already voiced a number of characters in her voice acting career, especially in kids shows, so this wouldn't be her first time voicing in one. It would be, however, her first time voicing a main character, something she's never done prior. So how exactly would she do in this new show? Well... Let's see how she fared. Ask the Storybots marked the first instance of Bo becoming a main player of the team, an ensemble cast who goes on adventures to answer questions in the outer world. Bo as a team member has gone through quite the journey throughout the seasons, and her growth as a character is on full display here. In Season 1, Bo was kind of all over the place at first. She was really in that early phase of her character, as the others were too. In most of her appearances, she was the type of person to love everything that she sees, which is something that happens very often in the series and beyond. And I don't think that is put on display more than in Season 1. Notably this one moment of her character for what I can only describe as a distracted montage, where she would go in a full monologue describing a thing, mainly a location, that she really loves, distracting the team in the process. It doesn't amount to anything in the story, and is really only there to pad out runtime and to drop some random trivia. This weirdly happens two times in this season, and by the second time, it was pretty evident to me that this would have potentially become a trope for her character. I'm not a big fan of this quirk, honestly, and dare I say this might be Bo at her weakest here, other than the obvious. I feel like if this was in fact a common trend with her character, she would start to become intolerable quite fast. Thankfully though, this doesn't become a frequent trend in the rest of the series, as we don't have any of these montages shown in future seasons. But the more I think about it though, and in retrospect, the more I start to wonder if this was actually an intentional move on the team's end, as the side of her character helps aid the plot in the special following this season. More on that when we get there. As for the rest of her appearances in Season 1, there are a few moments worth discussing. I like how in these intro sequences before the team gets sent out, she's the one involved in most of their activities, like the carrots for her pet rabbits, her enormous bouquet of flowers, and the guacamole used for their nacho party. That was a nice touch. And whenever she thinks she has the correct answer to a problem, she, admittedly, is sometimes a bit stupid. You know, night! You're a knight, and we're trying to find out how night happens! <laughs> Idiot! There's also this moment in the Sky episode, where she and the others panic about the sky being black. For some reason. Uh, beep! I hate to break it to you, but the sky's not blue. No, it's, uh, it's black. Despite her already knowing what nighttime is prior to this. However, that's more so a problem with the episode itself rather than the characters, so I'll give her a pass here. But my favorite moment from Bo in Season 1 is in the Rain episode. This is the episode where it firmly establishes Bo's fear for heights, something that would be maintained in the other projects following this. What I really love about this scene is Bo's determination here. In this episode, the team has to ride the Torrential Tower in order to figure out how rain is formed, a drop tower that is roughly 7,000 feet from ground level. Even though this is something way out of her comfort zone and would be absolutely terrified of doing something of such a tremendous scale, she still does it regardless, for the sole purpose of answering a kid's question. Do it for Dex! Do it for Dex! Do it for Dex! Do it for Dex! She doesn't necessarily conquer her fear here, as we later see that fear carry over in the other episodes, but it's the moment where she decided that she would risk her own life for a kid 
that really did it for me. It was a pleasant surprise seeing Bo in this light, and it's partially the reason why I consider this episode my favorite of the whole season. As we move into Seasons 2 and 3, Bo becomes quite the transformed character than before. She does keep a lot of her aspects in Season 1, of course, but we also get to see two different sides of her character that we never saw prior. The first one is kinda obvious, her vulnerable side. In some of the episodes, we see Bo being placed into situations where it's rightfully terrifying for her, and when she is in one of these scenarios, she can't help but emote her feelings. Like riding the gondola in the computer episode, <laughs> or being tasked to talk with the reptiles in the animals episode. Why did I have to be the one to count <coughs> reptiles? Or nearly getting crushed when she and her team escape a giant bulldozer. <coughs> All of these moments are great ways of showing how vulnerable even our most affectionate character can be at times. And it's understandable why. They're not like childish fears that one person would go through. They're more realistic in how it's presented. Bo is terrified in the gondola because of her fear of heights. Bo is afraid of talking with the reptiles because of its naturally creepy atmosphere. And Bo is scared during the chase with the bulldozer because she and everyone else literally thought they were gonna die. There's always a reason for Bo being scared all the time, and it's for that reason why fans care for her so much. No one wants to see Bo struggle through stuff that other people go through in their lives. It's relatable, and not impractical. The second aspect is a rather obscure one, her protective side. It only happens a couple times in the show, but it really is a glow-up compared to her previous portrayal. Whenever a team member is placed in peril, she will not hesitate in trying to save them, such as in the flower episode, where Bang gets caught in the spider web. Don't worry, Bang! I'll get you down from there! Boom. I get the feeling that if Beep weren't there to intervene, she more than likely would have attempted to rescue Bang in that situation. It's also... Very fitting to have Bo be the overprotective member of the group, using her big size to show how intimidating she might be, looking out for her friends whenever they're in danger. You don't want to mess around with Bo if her friends get mistreated. It's a very admirable moment of her character, chalking her up to the levels of leadership like Beep herself. A pretty underrated aspect, in my opinion. It should also be noted that during that time, Aaron got to voice more roles in the later seasons. Characters such as Roxy in the Volcano episode, the Polymerase in the DNA episode, and Angry Annie in the Recycling episode. And I think that notion of having Aaron Fitzgerald be more involved in the show was also worked into Bo's character to some degree, considering the abundance of roles that Aaron got to play here. And this will become even more apparent as we continue forward. One final detail before we get to the next show is something I just noticed when re-watching these episodes for the video. Every time the Storybots would get ready for transport, Bo would always put on some form of random hat before takeoff. In fact, this happens in every single episode here, and starts to become a running gag for the show. It's nothing relevant to the story or anything, but it does make for a cute scene regardless. I wouldn't be surprised if Eren herself was the one who requested this little detail, only for the team to implement that in the show because they too thought it was cute. I'm really happy that they did that. And also... I just love how many cute moments there are with Bo. Her love for cats in the computer episode is very arousing. Her affection for babies in the DNA episode is both astounding and hilarious at the same time. And, oh my god, that scene where she wears that flower in the flower song is just so adorable. How can you not love that? Storybot Super Songs was a more simple show compared to its previous one. Instead of having the Storybots go on big adventures into the outer world, we instead get something different. In every episode, half the time would be used for sing-along songs from the early years of Storybots, and the other half would have little shorts of the Storybots interacting with the children and discussing various different topics. And with this, the characters were also a bit simplified, now only having a few appearances in every episode when needed. And Bo was no exception to that. While she really doesn't have any big spotlight roles in this show, like the others, she does get a few moments worth noting. The first point of interest is in the very first episode, where Bo is shown to be playing with her toy unicorn. It's actually our first instance where we see Bo's interest in unicorns, a main staple for her character in future projects. In fact, this is something that's shown quite a few more times in this show. It's honestly fascinating knowing that a core aspect of Bo's character started off in Super Songs. Never would have thought about that. And I love seeing Bo acting like a child in this scene, playing with her unicorn so carefree. There's just something so wholesome about that, you know? In the second episode, we see Beep listening to everyone's heartbeats. However, when she listens to Bo's heart, her heartbeat is so powerful that it knocks everyone to the ground, only for Beep to make the conclusion that Bo has a big heart. You must have a big heart, Bo! And 
Yeah, that's right, Bo does have a big heart, perfectly in character. In the fifth episode, we see Bo's talent for sculpting, with her latest creation... Ode to the Rectangle! Ooh, nice work, Bo! And in episode 9, we also see that Bo is an amazing architect, creating a massive castle of blocks all by herself. It's got four bedrooms, 22 bathrooms, two dance halls, eight kitchens, and 16 walk-in closets! I'm really impressed by this. I love seeing Bo's creative side at play. I would so like to imagine Bo creating my dream house in real life. I bet it would be awesome. There are a few more glimmering moments. I like how Bo tries to convince Bang to ride a dog sled all the way to Hawaii using the puppy dog eye technique. But the dogs are so cute! Uh, okay. Yay! I like how whenever she tries to go for a hug, she always never has a reason for it. She just does it for the sake of hugging, and nothing else. I don't know why we're hugging, but I don't care. <laughs> and I like how even someone such as Bo can sometimes get a bit irritated, such as when the interrupting cow keeps <coughs> keeps interrupting. Seriously, how does anyone tolerate with that guy? Overall, Bo was handled quite well in Super Songs. She may not have had any major roles in any of the episodes, but at least the team was still pulling all the stops for the characters, which is far better than what I can say about her next appearance. Disclaimer, this may get gross. Okay. I know I should keep this extremely brief here, but we have to talk about Bo's involvement in the space adventure. We all know why this special was such a flop. I've talked about it numerous times before. But in short, a new team by Netflix who had no idea of what the Storybots was, were commissioned to create a special tie-in project to the SpaceX mission, Inspiration 4. With loads of deadlines and baffling decisions under their belt, the team hastily put together the story in less than a month, which resulted in the special that we all know as the Storybot Space Adventure. One thing that I forgot to mention in my original Space Adventure review is the characters themselves, specifically Bo. This was something I just noticed upon my latest rewatch of the special, and truth be told, it actually made the experience of watching it again for the video a bit worse for me. Of all the characters in this special, I can safely say that Bo was handled absolutely terribly! There is so much wrong with her character here that it's unheard of. Literally nothing was retained from any of Bo's previous adventures. They changed her so much that it's almost unrecognizable of who she is anymore. Aside from her voice actor, this is not the Bo that we all know and love. But there's a lot of factors that explains why this is the case. For one thing, the new team never consulted the Writer's Bible, which outlines all the characteristics and main points that goes into every single character in the show. Link to that will be down below. And because they never saw her character bio, this led to a bunch of inconsistencies with her character. The first red flag is in the very first scene, when Bo accidentally sends Bang up the wrong tube, only for her to say this. I'm sorry, why would she say something like that? Bang was in a position of potential danger, and not once did she think, I don't know, they should go after him first? She did that in the previous series, when Bang was also in a similar scenario. Even though there was a task at hand, she still attempted to jump in and save him. But here, she just drops it, and pretty much ignores Bang's safety throughout the entire special. What, does she not care about her teammates anymore? Yeah! And I kinda wonder where Bang is. Gee, I wonder what Bang is doing, considering I clearly saw him go up the wrong tube, and contributed absolutely nothing towards his safety whatsoever. Disgusting. But no, it doesn't end there. The inconsistencies just keep piling up. In the next scene, when the rocket is talking very fast, she tells him... to slow down. Rocket! Excuse me! Ah, uh, you're talking super fast! <sighs> Bo! How stupid are you? Bing is right in front of you! He also talks very fast, and you never complained about it to him? So why are you making this an issue? Oh my god, I just can't with the special. Also, remember Bo's fear for heights? Yeah, it's been rid of here. She goes up like about 100 feet in the air, and never does she ever get scared or think gravely about it. The real Bo wouldn't act like this. No, she'd be horrified and would want to get down to safety as quickly as possible, something that they were very consistent about prior to this. I guess they sort of hint at some sort of fear with Bo and the rocket, considering that she started to panic right when they're about to launch. Launch? Oh dear, I'm not ready! I'm not but then only a few seconds later, she completely forgets everything for the sake of the music video. Now being as happy as can be, bad ending. But the dumbest, THE DUMBEST decision made on Bo's character is this. While she can be viewed as someone who is unintelligent in this special, she also is depicted as the voice of reason and the one who's more intelligent than the others. I don't know, Bang. 
Maybe we should let the real space travelers answer. All right, let that sink into your head for a minute. Who in their right minds thought that was a good idea? What was the thought process here? So a dumb-minded character can also be viewed as someone as smart as Beep? The... just... how? Those two statements alone contradict each other! Why would you write someone like this? How does any of this make sense? Okay, enough ranting about that special. I've dragged this on for way too long now. Let's move on to something more positive. I gotta be honest with you guys, I didn't really find much regarding Bo's character here. But that is to be expected, this is just a music collection after all, so the team couldn't really have that many character moments like the previous shows did. That being said, there are one or two moments in this series, if you can call it a series that is, that I really liked. Her only major appearance in this collection was in the question mark song, where she's writing a letter to her long distance friend, Jane. A character who only appears in this song, and we never see her again. Like, I get it's just a music video, and you're not supposed to think much about it regarding the lore, but it would have been nice if she was used more in future projects, because frankly, I think she would have been a perfect fit in something like Answer Time. But that's just me. Bo, on the other hand, I thought was quite interesting. She's viewed as an inquisitive here, asking all these questions that she's very curious about. Like where is Timbuktu, what is Lunar New Year, and why is nighttime dark? Wait, why is she asking that question? She already answered that question before. Hmm... You know, I'm starting to sense a pattern here. Other than that music video, that's pretty much it for her. The rest of her appearances are incredibly minor, only existing to teach whatever's being taught in said music video. While she barely appears in this song collection, I'd gladly take this over that abomination. However, I am happy to say that her next appearance would be a rather big one, for this next project would heavily focus on Bo's character. She would become the first Storybot ever to receive her very own spin-off. Super Silly Stories with Bo is where Bo's presence in the franchise truly started to become apparent. The first time where a Storybot gets their own dedicated spin-off show, all to themselves. This show would have a very different structure compared to everything else that came before. It's the only show to have 26 episodes in total, and the only show to not be featured on the Netflix streaming service, making this series a YouTube exclusive. Henry Dalton would be the main driving force behind the spin-off, taking inspiration from previous projects that he's worked on and working them into this new show. With the help of Evan, Greg, and of course Aaron Fitzgerald, they all contributed to get this spin-off show off the ground. Back in 2021, the brothers opened up a submission form where kids can send their own questions via computers to have them be featured in their show. Half of these submissions would be worked into Storybot's answer time, and the other half would be going into this new spin-off, the latter of which would be a key feature into the structure behind these many stories. With everything ready to go, production started that very year, and on June 26, 2022, the first episode was released to the public, with the show itself lasting until mid-2023. So here's how it goes. Every episode would start with Bo introducing the kids to her storybook. As the story begins, she starts off by explaining what her story is all about, and everything seems to be normal at first. But then... it quickly goes south. In between parts of the story, the kids would start yelling many random words interrupting the flow of the story. Some of them were... relatively tame, while others... are beyond chaotic. They heaped up bananas and chicken nuggets like mad! Donuts! Popcorn! A poisonous snake. Wait, what? In the end, the story concludes in a rather unique way than before, and Bo would show the kids the next story they'll read, only for it too to be changed. Okay, I give up. Okay, let's talk about Bo in this spinoff. Now, I really love Bo here, not just because we now have a key storybot leaning in her very own spin-off, but also that it was specifically written with her character in mind. During production of the spin-off, and other shows around that time, the team created a huge document outlining all the features about the franchise entitled The Big Bible. In the characters section, they describe each of the main characters in great detail, and add some extra trivia alongside it. Things such as their full name, where they came from, and other little secrets. And unlike a certain special where it chose to ignore or past events, the other shows would be strictly based on this document alone. For Bo, it's described in her spare time that she loves telling stories, painting, making crafts, decorating, and baking. The storytelling element would be directly pulled into the spin-off, as well as others here and there.
As a central figure, this brings up some new elements about her character that we never saw before. Notably, how she's now a big figure towards the kids, both figuratively and literally. She really feels like a guardian of sorts, watching over the kids just like how a mother would. Whenever the kids act up on her, she'll try her best to fix the situation, but if the kids won't budge, she'll have no choice but to oblige. Can we keep them? Please! Well, okay, okay, I guess it could be a Velociraptor. I really like how it especially works with her specific character, because it parallels a side of Bo that we've already seen before, her protective side. Using that element and expanding upon it in her new perspective flows pretty well here. It is so entertaining watching Bo essentially babysit the kids here, and it makes for some pretty hilarious scenery. I mean, really, what's not to love? She is still, of course, the emotional bow we all know, as we'll see in this next example. Another element that gets expanded upon in the spin-off is Bo's love for unicorns. This started all the way back in Storybot Super Songs, but now it's starting to become a main staple with her character. This spin-off and Asa Storybots would both utilize this aspect as a main trope for her character. We get an entire episode devoted to this characteristic, Unicorn Ride. In this one, Bo's affection for unicorns is on full display, complete with a woolly unicorn hat for added effect. She is very extreme in this one, almost like she can't hold her emotional side from bursting or something. She literally screams her heart out in a good part of the episode, a truly fascinating experience, to say the least. I also really like how much Eren is involved in the spin-off. Now obviously with her character being the spotlight, it should be a no-brainer, but there's a few quirks in here that really make her stand out. In the episode Lollipop Mountain, we have Bo creating her very own video game for the kids, a nice change-up from the usual storybook format that we're so used to. It is chock full of video game references from many different genres. If you're a video game nerd like me, you'll get pretty much all of them. But what I like about this episode in particular is the fact that it's an in-joke of Eren's previous work in the video game industry, and the games they chose to reference here reflect this. this is a really enjoyable episode all around, and one of the greatest in the whole spin-off. But one detail that really caught me off guard was this one. You see that kid right there? The one who drew that rocket in the time travel episode? Yeah, that's Eren's niece right there. Her freaking niece got to work on the spin-off. It is insane that a family member of Eren can work on such a big project like this. I was actually taken aback the moment Eren shared that information with me. It literally blew me away. I can now see how this episode would be very close to Eren's heart, a connection that Eren herself will never forget in her entire career. Uh, that in the Unicorns episode, I mean, come on! But what makes this spinoff so special for me is how it ends. In the final episode, a troll comes out of nowhere and eats the last story that Bo was going to read to the kids, so she hastily tries to come up with a new story within that time. When she's all out of options and ready to give up, the kids then decide to give her what she desires, a long, uninterrupted beach vacation. This was where it really struck home for me, as the kids' appreciation for Bo is really, really strong here. All this time leading up to this, Bo would always deliver the best story that the kids could ever ask for. So what do the kids do in return? They give her the best present of all, unicorns included. It shows how respectful these kids are to Bo. They're not just little demons who don't care for anything in the world, like most kids are. No, they actually have a great respect for Bo, and genuinely enjoy the stuff she tells them. Like any mother telling a story to their kids, they show real compassion to her. Quite simply, Bo loves the kids, and the kids love Bo. <laughs> you guys are the best! This, in my opinion, is a wonderful send-off to this series, and I don't think it could have ended any better. It's affectionate, it's adorable, and it's heartwarming. Bo in this spin-off was an absolute treat of a character. She's consistently enjoyable throughout all of these episodes, and Eren's involvement in this one is very shining. I think a lot of fans will really stick with this series for Bo's involvement alone. This is, and forever will be, a testament to Bo's character and Eren herself. Simply amazing.
Answer Time is where everything from Storybots transformed. All of the elements from the previous Storybots projects would be present and given a brand new light. This new show would feature more locations in the computer world, more questions than ever before, and a heavy focus on its large cast of characters. The main characters in particular were a notable highlight of the show, with each character embarking on separate journeys and showing more characteristics about themselves that we never saw before. And that meant Bo's already massive following was ever the more golden. And to put it simply, her role in the show is pretty damn wonderful. In the two seasons of Answer Time, she got a total of five lead roles, which is an extra more than the other storybots, who all had four roles each. Well, except for Bing, but that's a story for another day. Her first spotlight episode is in Season 1's Sand, where she tries to find out where Sand comes from. And right off the bat, we are put in a situation filled with one of Bo's favorite interests, kitty cats. This was something that was actually referenced all the way back in Season 2 of Asa's Storybots, where Bo and the others were transporting a coded cat back to the OS operator. Okay, Mr. Kitty Cat, we're out of that dusty hard drive now. The OS will take good care of you! It is also a point that was pulled right from the writer's bible. Note this line, you do not want to stand between Bo and the cuddly kitty. And her love for cats is very apparent here. It's a pretty fun scene. Watching Bo dealing with all the cat shenanigans is hilarious. I love that. Despite all the claw rips and scratch marks that she endures throughout this act, she never gives it up and continues regardless. That right there is true dedication. In the next act, she falls into a movie set, and it's here where she learns where Sand comes from. She gets picked for the role to play the Quartz in their film, Dooms of Desire, where she and another piece of Quartz go on a treacherous journey to become the common mineral, Sand. They split up along the way, only to reunite with each other at the end. The two of them hug each other as the camera zooms out, and the sun starts to set. Now, Bo's performance in this scene is very extraordinary, and again, was another quirk that was taken from the writer's bible, with it stating that she graduated with a degree in drama, and this perfectly aligns with her role in this episode. It makes sense for her to be great at acting, as she literally had a degree studying that field. Very fitting for her. Her next lead role would be in the episode Taste, where she has to find out how taste works. She first stops at Chef Pierre's restaurant, accidentally knocking him out in the process. She incidentally becomes temporary chef and takes charge of the food. We finally see her cooking side come into play, and yet again, it's another aspect from the writer's bible. That being said though, it is also shown that she is incredibly terrible at cooking. All the dishes that she prepares in this episode are just awful. I mean, vegetable soup with ice cream and a flour, spaghetti with maple syrup and hot dogs, and chocolate cake with ketchup? Ew! What the hell kind of food has she been eating lately? Jeez, imagine how Gordon Ramsay would react to this. You surprise me to how shit you are. I think I've created a monster. But it ultimately didn't matter, for the lead manager of the Taste Buds burst in and thought the food was actually good, and gave Bo a ticket to their new concert later tonight. When she arrives at the concert, she is greeted by the Taste Buds, five band members that represent the five basic tastes. They show her how exactly taste works in the form of a song. We then see how it all unfolds while Bo dances her heart out. It's pretty enjoyable seeing Bo being utilized in this music video, like she's a dancing queen of sorts. Overall, a good episode, and a great use for Bo. Her next spotlight role will be in the Season 2 episode, Moon. In this one, she has to find out how the moon keeps changing shapes. She stops by Madame Ruth's place, a fortune teller who apparently knows the answer to every single question in the world. Or so she can. Not really much to say regarding Bo's character here. You can literally have anyone play this role, honestly. But what is a peak of interest, however, is in the next act. She boards a carnival ride with some kids that take her on a simulation to the moon. While on the ride, she starts to go into a panic attack as the ride spins faster and faster. <laughs> Trying to stop it, she accidentally breaks the ride, causing the kids to cry. After she repairs everything, it's here where she finds her answer. What makes this scene so interesting to me was how it was set up. Now, whenever Bo gets to interact with children, usually she's the mentor figure to them. I mean, we got an entire series devoted to that aspect alone, so it's something we should all be familiar with by now. But in this scene, we get the opposite. It subverts our expectations of Bo compared to the norm. Instead of Bo teaching the kids, it's the kids teaching Bo. It's a nice little inverse of our usual trope for Bo, showing how even our big protective characters such as Bo still has a lot to learn. I wish they did more stuff like that. And then we have Glass, my favorite Bo episode from Answer Time. In this one, Bo has to find out how people make glass. She first visits the construction yard to see a new building being made out of glass. She wounds up on a high-rising beam, only to realize at the last second how high up she is, and fears for her life. 
Nice to see that the continuity of her fear of heights is still present here. In fact, I think this is the only time in the show where it's referenced. Glad to see they haven't forgotten about it. For the most part. She tries to climb back down, but she ends up going on the ride of her life. Rather recklessly, I may add. It's a very hilarious scene, and the cherry on top is that it caused the construction's accident-free record to plummet. After that fiasco, she then heads for the glass factory, where she is greeted by a fancy tour guide, Amber. A rather... snobby, entitled person to be around. She holds her position up very high, and won't stand for any bullshit. This shouldn't be a problem for Bo. Until... it happens. A tiny crab enters the factory and into a big sandpit. From our perspective, we can see the crab leave off screen. But from Bo's perspective... It tells a different story. She thinks the crab is still in there, as a giant crusher appears and begins crushing the sand. She tries to tell Amber about the situation, but being the self-entitled Karen that she is, she won't budge. This escalates pretty fast, and it got her blood boiling to the point where she utters this line. Ma'am, if you cannot follow the rules, I'm going to ask you to leave. Understand? With her being a potential threat, Bo has no choice but to agree. As we head along the factory where we as the audience get to learn how glass is being formed, Bo, meanwhile, begins to worry. The tension between Bo and the crab keeps building up as they go. This leads up to the point where she finally finds the crab thinking it's encased in glass, and when she can no longer hold it anymore, she, for the first time, begins to cry. This is where I think she really peaked as a character in this show. That moment when she blew up into tears is something to write home about. It wasn't the first time, of course. We have seen her like this before. But this is our first instance where she becomes emotional to such an enormous scale. And it truly shows. Her concern for the crab is understandable. She never becomes insufferable in her emotional state. And it's just something we can all relate to. This is why we care for Bo. We don't want her to suffer. And we want to comfort her. In the end, she finds out that the crab did in fact survive, and heads back to her office to answer the question. A fantastic episode in my opinion, and one of the greatest moments from Bo in the entire show. Her last major appearance was in the internet episode, where she tries to stop a message that Stacy accidentally sent to his boss. Here we learn everything about the internet and how it operates. She's also greeted by the internet wizard, a computer geek who knows the insides and outs of the World Wide Web. Not really much to add to her character, but I do like Bo's determination here. Going out of her way to stop a message from getting through. Traveling through routers, scrambling through piles of code, and even attempting to hold onto the packets to stop them from being sent. But all that fails, and the message gets sent through. Even though it was all for nothing, at least she tried, and at the end of the day, that's all that really mattered to her. But hey, it ended up being beneficial to Stacy after all, so at least there's a good ending to this. It's a good episode, and a unique way of ending Bo's saga. As always, there are other small moments of her character that I really adore. I like how she cuddles a baby skunk in this scene, despite its horrendous stench. Isn't that stinky? Yes, but they are still so cute! She just can't pass up the cute ones, it's literally impossible. I love how she shows concern to Bing when he gets all worked up over a video game. Oh, Bing, maybe it's time to take a break from the game? I like this moment where she's just terrible at playing the bagpipe. Actually, I think these may be broken. I also like how she can't decide what her favorite fruit is here. Oh, and apples? No, 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 grapes. Oh, actually, make it bananas. No, apples. Oh, they're all so good. I can't decide. I love how she cuddles the mutated shark bear, even though it's described as a monster. Oh, can I keep them? No. Uh, fine. I like her attempt at playing hide and seek by holding boop in front of her face. That was honestly pretty cute. Oh, yep. You got me. Well, that was fun, but also stressful. And Oh my god, that desk setup she has in her office is just so adorable. Everything about it just screams Bo. I love that attention to detail they put in there. Spot on. Continuing off Eren's roles in Ass of Storybots, she gets to play more characters in this show. And golly, does she have a lot more roles this time! Bo, Gob, Story Storybird, Ranger Dot, Eleanor Smarty Pants, Erg, holy cow that's a lot! She voices pretty much every female character in the show. Well, most of them anyway. If there's a female character on screen, you could bet your dollar that Aaron's voicing at least one of them. And with every character that she gets to voice, she also gives a different performance to all the characters to make them stand out from one another. And her incredible vocal range makes each character that more recognizable. You can hardly tell that all these characters were voiced by the same person who voiced Bo. I could be totally wrong about this, but I think this is the most involvement that Aaron has received in a single show. And that alone is seriously impressive. 
But wait, we're not done yet. We still have all those character segments to talk about. So let's get into those. In between the acts of the episode, little segments would play starring each of the members of Team 341B. In each segment, we're presented with the universe of that character's desires and dreams. For Bo's universe, we have Bo's World, which the idea itself is a reference to two other shows. The name is a reference to Elmo's World, yet another connection to Sesame Street. And the aesthetic of the world is a reference to Pee-wee's Playhouse, the flowers being the main giveaway. We have two segments about this world. One is about baby teeth, and the other about pollination. Now I think it goes without saying that this is Bo's ideal world. All of her likes and desires that we've come to know over these past few years are all present here. Her animal friends, flowers, rainbows, and unicorns. You can't have Bo's world without unicorns. It's just impossible. These segments are really, really adorable and a great fit for Bo's persona. Overall, Answer Time really did justice for Bo. Her colossal amount of screen time and the amount of character moments that Bo experiences in this show is truly phenomenal. And with the amount of characters that Aaron got to voice in this project, it made her dedication as a voice actor that more glamorous. If there is one show that knows how to take care of Aaron well, it'd be this one. And that's pretty much it for Bo, right? Well, not quite. There is one more part I forgot to talk about, and I intentionally wanted to leave that part out for last. For I think out of all the moments that Bo's experienced in her lifetime, this is the one where she had her finest hour, and the one that changed Aaron's whole life around. Forever. It's an adventure like no other, and one that shouldn't be overlooked. I'm of course talking about the 2017 special, A Storybot's Christmas. <laughs> This special successfully achieves at what it was trying to accomplish. A story that takes one of our main characters and puts them through a trial. That being Bo. If there is anything that shows Bo at her greatest, it's here. The special starts off with the Storybots answering a question on what the best Christmas present of all is. While the team starts giving out suggestions, Bo meanwhile notices something. She realizes that none of her friends are talking about the gifts that she made for them. Did they just forget? Or was it all a misunderstanding? This makes her apprehensive and wonder. She thinks back to the times where she was a distraction to the team, always putting her emotions first before everyone else's. Hell, we see this exact thing in the beginning of the special. She's got a rainbow Bo? mane, and a rainbow tail, Bo? and a rainbow saddle. Bo! I think Isla has a question for us, right Isla? Yep. Oops, sorry. After recuperating all her thoughts, and now hearing what her friends are saying, Bo finally comes to the conclusion that maybe just maybe, she's a burden to them, and doesn't treat her as an actual friend. Heartbroken, she goes back to her room to think of an idea. Only at the last minute, Bo misses out on hearing on who the team actually thinks gives out the best presents of all. But we all know who gives the best, most awesomest presents in the world, right? Bo! Now, everything starts to crumble. The team have no idea where Bo's gone to, and Bo is still moping about being a failure. There are now two problems. This is what kickstarts the plot. Bo then finds a snow globe from Santa's workshop. Being confident that's where she'll find her answer, she brings her stuffed unicorn with her and ventures off to the North Pole. When she arrives, she finds the workshop to be rather empty, with only a crying elf in Santa's office. He explains to Bo that Santa has gone missing, and without him, the presents won't be made in time for Christmas morning. She stumbles upon a cookie box that came from New York City, and makes no hesitation to go there. She does find Santa here, but not the Santa she's familiar with. She wonders why he's not at the North Pole making presents right now, to which he responds that he's just old and can't keep up with the presents anymore. He's essentially given up on everything in life, which is a far cry from the jolly happy Santa we all know. Bo then concedes and starts relating to Santa by telling him why she gave up on her friends, because she failed them. Now the two of them are in a tight spot, and it doesn't look like they'll be going anywhere anytime soon. Meanwhile, back at the answer department, the team sets out on a big search for Bo. Using the travel logs, they find out that she went to the North Pole. So they retrace her steps into Santa's office, and find out from that same elf that she also went to New York City. They later arrive at the city, and begin the massive search. However, after hours of scavenging the city, they begin to lose hope. With such a big city she's in, the team just admits that finding Bo in New York is just impossible. And so, they may never get to find Bo in time for Christmas. But then, they find her, sitting on a bench with Santa. They reunite in the best way possible. The team reassures Bo that she's not a failure, and that her gifts are not what makes them happy. But being together as friends is all that matters. And after a short music video plays, this leads into possibly one of the best scenes in the entire franchise. Them hugging each other. Oh, you guys! 
guys are the best! Oh, you're the best, dear. <laughs> this scene, right here, is where I actually started to tear up. I just couldn't help the amount of emotions going through my head at that moment. I don't think describing it hits the same way for a lot of people. I think just showing it to you all speaks volumes more. After that cute scene, the team then helps out Santa by having the entire Storybot department help make presents for the kids. And before long, all the presents got delivered. They all cheer and celebrate, and Bo and Santa come out as better people than they were before, both now understanding the true meaning of Christmas. They answer the question for Isla, and the special concludes. What. An. Ending. Everything about this special is amazing, but what really hits it out of the park for me is how much this is a Bo-centric story. We're so used to the adorable, vulnerable, protective, mother-like, a uh, frankly stupid side of her character that gets tossed around in this series, but here is a story that deals with an internal struggle. I think this is the first time where a character's actions directly affect the plot of the story. Now in a typical Storybots episode, their goal is pretty much the same. They are given a question to answer, and they come back with a response. And although they technically do that in the special, it's not focused around that. For this is a more grounded, personal story about Bo and her struggles with her own insecurities. She started off as a lovable, go-lucky, happy type that admires everything that she can lay her eyes on, but she mostly let her emotions get the better of her, only hindering the team's performance as a result. Only until now does she finally realize that because of her constant interruptions, this gives her the mindset that she may very well be an obstacle for the team. And it's not like she immediately came to that conclusion without any prior thought. No, they actually set that up in Season 1, whether intentional or not. And when it finally pays off in the special, her character journey flows pretty well. Because after this, she becomes a much better character than before. No more is she trying to let her emotions override her personality, she instead tries to improve them, becoming more protective about her teammates in the process. It's the only one I could say that had some actual conflict in it, for all the other characters don't really have much of a story quite like Bo. And it's also relatable. Lots of people go through this exact same struggle in real life. Having people you've known for quite a while now, suddenly having a different perspective on who you are. That constant fear that your friends may not think that you're so special to them and then they start shunning you. I myself can relate to this situation quite a bit. And to all the others who are going through this exact struggle right now, this will be a touching story to your heart. Of course, her friends all reassure Bo that she's not a bad person, and they actually have great respect for her. We all know this is not the case. But for Bo, it's the greatest news she's ever heard. Bo's not just a team member to them, she has compassion. Bo is a true friend and always will be. It's a fun little character study of one of the show's main characters, and the whole special is properly structured around this single arc. There are no B-plots or cuts to other characters doing random stuff. Our undivided attention, for the most part, never deters from Bo. The special is very focused as a result, and tells a clear, conclusive story. A Storybots Christmas is a pretty damn good special. It hits all the right marks for me. And it's a wonderful outing for one of our show's main protagonists. A perfect swan song for Bo. Now that we've gone through all of Bo's major appearances in the franchise, you might be wondering, out of all the characters in Storybots, why was Bo chosen to be the poster child? From all her appearances throughout the series, it's easy to tell that Bo was clearly the favorite on the writing team. I mean, a full special and an entire spin-off devoted to her character? It should be obvious. But why her? Why not someone more appropriate like Beep, the leader of the group? What about Bo makes her so important? The answer to that question is actually pretty simple. You may think that this was a predetermined decision that started off by the brothers at the very beginning. Well, it's not that. It's actually a more personal reason. A reason that was fully under the hands by Eren. Bo is unlike any character that Eren has voiced previously, for she holds a very special place in her heart. And here's why. You see, Eren doesn't just voice this particular character. Eren literally is this character. Everything that she embodies, like her emotions and feelings, is basically a self-image of her own person. This is one of those rare instances where the voice actor is the character. If she was any fictional character in that world, Bo would fit that role perfectly. And this is thanks to the creative liberties that Storybots is known for. Whereas her previous roles were all characters that were pre-established and had to suit whatever voice that said character needed. Not to say that Eren can't deliver a voice for any character, of course she can. But the fact that she can create and voice a character on the 
spot is pretty insane. Eren knew that she struck gold when taking the role of this character, because she can literally do whatever she wanted with her, and all those other roles that she got to play for the series and beyond made her involvement in the show that more pleasant. Then she got a bunch of awards from this character, I mean come on, this is her favorite. Whatever Eren wants to put on her character, the team can implement that in any way possible. She wants unicorns? They can do it. She wants a special to herself? They can do it. She wants a spin-off? They can do it. She wants specific moments with her character? They can do it. Anything that she imagines, the brothers can make it reality. That's why Bo is so important. Because Eren made her important. The real credit goes to her. I mentioned before that Bo's appearance represents both her personality and size, but now I see Bo in another way. A symbolic way. To me, her big size kind of reminds me of her impact on the show, and the legacy she left behind. Without Bo, a significant amount of material would be lost. No special, no spin-off, no character moments, no unicorns, no kitty cats, nothing. Storybots just wouldn't be the same without our cute and lovable Bo. If your favorite character is in fact Bo, then you must be pretty happy with your decision. You have chosen a very unique character in the roster, and with all her appearances in every single project, there is no shortage of our one and only Bo. While she may not be my personal favorite of the five, she's the one that I have the most respect for, and her impact on the show is pretty hard to pass up. And that alone is something to be proud of. However, I do need to add one more thing. Throughout everything across the franchise, there's always been that form of disconnect between the shows. Every one of them is so distinctive in its personality, charm, and uniqueness factor, but they also sort of drift apart from each other like there's no special link connecting them. I mean, how are any of these shows connected at all? This is a franchise for literal infants, so there's no possible relationship here, right? No. There is a connection. How could you forget? There is something special about these series, something that ties all of this together. And you wanna know what's crazy? We've been looking right at it this whole time. It's pretty easy to just brush off these things since you're really not going to think twice about it. But when you finally do see that connection, it then clicks into your head, and you realize just how much there is to appreciate. Everything that we do, telling stories, cooking, drawing pictures, singing, and decorating. Everything that we feel, happiness, sadness, silliness, annoyance, fear, determination, obsolescence, and acceptance. Everything that we see, all these places, new inventions, familiar memories, and our friends, they're all here. It's so crazy to think that our minds are always so keen to forget these little details, when really, it couldn't have been ever the more obvious. There's a reason why many people come back to this franchise so often, and you're looking at one of them. Whenever we see Team 341B on screen, we always think that Beep is the one who brings everyone together, and no doubt that is something you've probably seen quite a few times already. But this time, it's different. It's warm, comfortable, colorful, bright, and so full of life in a way that nothing else in the world can even compare. It's Bo. Well, I hope you enjoyed this long take of an essay. I know this is quite a lot to take in, but hopefully you find this to be useful, and that you've learned at least something to appreciate with this character. Next time, we'll take a look at another character on the team, and I'm almost positive that after this particular video, a certain blue guy will be next. But that's a story for another day.
In case you haven't noticed yet, today marks a very special day. A day that's Aaron Fitzgerald's birthday. If you're wondering, the girl turns 52 today. Holy mackerel. Now, if you remember way back when, I made a fan art showcase for Aaron's birthday last year, so I thought I'd make something different this year, and hopefully it works out for everyone. If you're watching this, Aaron, I want to wish you the greatest birthday ever. I know a lot of fans are very happy hearing your voice in this show, and I personally want to send my gratitude to all your performances throughout the years. So please take this video as a thank you. And remember, hashtag unicorns forever. For my first creator spotlight, I want to shout out a person who's also made a character analysis of one of Eren's roles. The ultimate analysis of Chie Satanaka by Hiding in Private. Now I'm not too familiar with the Persona video game series, but hearing all this information about one of Eren's characters was truly fascinating. This video goes into great detail behind the inner workings of Chie from Persona 4 Golden. If you're a fan of Persona and want to know more about the characters, then this is the video for you. My next shoutout is another character analysis. Geez, there's quite a few. This one is on C.A. Cupid from the Monster High series, and is done by Lemon Cakes. Again, I'm not at all familiar with anything Monster High related, but it was a real treat knowing more about one of Eren's characters in the show. If any of you are Monster High fans or Ever After High fans, then this video might just suit you. For my last shoutout, I'll give it to a very important person in the Storybots franchise. Henry Dalton, the lead director in the spin-off show, Super Silly Stories with Bo. His piece of work I'll be shouting out is a little series called Lush Town. Now I am a sucker for anything noir styled, and this one is no exception. It's unpredictable, it's funny, and it's charming. Great stuff all around. I made a playlist of all the episodes from that series, so please check that out while you can. I also want to thank you all for reaching 10,000 subscribers! I never thought I'd reach that number honestly, nor did I expect we'd reach it so soon. But alas, we finally made it. I personally want to thank you all for sticking around this past year. It has been quite the roller coaster of events, and I can't thank you all enough. I do indeed have plans for this particular milestone, but I shan't say any more, for I will spoil the surprise to you all. I will keep you all updated though when that gets closer. Storybots fans, you don't want to miss this. As for major updates to the channel, the next big project I'll be working on is Part 2 of The Retrospective, where we'll take our first look into Ask the Storybots, starting with Season 1. The scripts are nearing completion, and recording should start very soon. Don't know exactly when this will release, but again, I'll keep you all notified when it comes out. So please stay tuned. That's all from me, guys. I think I'm gonna get some rest now. Have a wonderful day, everyone. And I'll see you all next time.